Tonight I'll talk about epistemology. Um, if we're going to talk about translational genomics, we have to discuss several issues. One, what is knowledge? What are we doing? Okay. Um, so what is science? If we don't know how to, what science is, we can't talk about translating science. Two, after that, then we have to specify what the problems of translational genomics are and what is the form of that knowledge. And I'll do that next week. And then once we've done that, then we have to talk about how we attack the problems, what kind of structures, what kind of experiments are done, what kind of mathematical structures are done to try to formalize that knowledge and make it useful. So tonight I'll talk about science. I'm going to begin with a quote from a Spanish philosopher. And this was said in 1930. Um, probably very few people have heard of uh, Jose Ortega Gasset, but he's the most famous Spanish philosopher of the 20th century. And he wrote um, in 1930, he was concerned about the problem of the society in the sense that would there, be a, would there be a culture, would there be some way we could actually talk to each other about, uh, besides at the level of, let's say, barbarism. And he wrote, has the, he has a great book, it's called Revolt of the Masses. It's one of his great books. And his quote is in the book. Whoever wishes to have ideas must first prepare himself to desire truth. That's critical. You have to desire truth. Otherwise, you're just talking. Okay? And to accept the rules of the game imposed to us. It is no use speaking of ideas when there is no acceptance of a higher authority to regulate them, a series of standards to which it is possible to appeal in a discussion. What I affirm is that there is no culture where there are no standards. Now, this in some sense was obvious, but it's not obvious any longer. It was obvious at one time. We can't possibly talk about something unless we agree on some set of rules by which we're going to address the truth of what we're talking about, i.e., we need some rules governing our epistemology. We need some idea of rules of what we're going to speak about. Now, those rules are not given to us. We have to make them up as a culture. A, a society has to agree on those rules. Now, he was talking about culture, but he was also wise enough to realize that science itself was in danger. He was one of the first people to realize the danger, this threat posed to science. And this was in 1930 at science, the highest point science ever reached. Remember, the first half of the 20th century was the pinnacle of science. Of course, all the sciences, physics, mathematics, statistics, uh, biology, chemistry. So he was speaking at a time when science was at its strongest point ever, and he was warning of its decline, uh, quite prescient. Now, what are the rules of the game? If we're going to speak to each other, and we're not going to just keep screaming at each other like a bunch of politicians, then we have to set down some rules. And the rules are the rules that govern our sense of knowledge. And I, what is epistemology? Okay. And this talk has lots of quotes, so um, bear with me. But I, I wanted to quote people who are experts, because some of these ideas could, might be considered controversial. I didn't pull them out of the air. Uh, Wilhelm, Wilhelm Wittelbahn was a great uh, German uh, philosopher around the turn of the century, 1900s. And he has a very famous book on history of philosophy, and he defines epistemology. He says, the problems, finally, which arise from the questions concerning the range and limit of man's knowing faculty, i.e., uh, mind, and its relation to the reality to be known, form the subject matter of epistemology, or the theory of knowledge. In other words, what is the range or the nature of our knowledge? What are its limits? Our knowledge is not unlimited. What are the limits of our knowledge? And what is the relation of this to reality? In other words, do we, is our knowledge concerned reality, or is it just hot air? Okay. Now, for science, this means something very particular. It has to, be, has to relate to the empirical observation that we make in experiments. Okay. So that's, our, that's where our, 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 we come in as scientists. Now, why do we face the epistemological problem of biology? Actually, it's quite simple. The systems biology raises the epistemological question. Okay. Before you have systems, you just have observations. You have variables, you measure them, you may collect data, you may have a storehouse of data, you may have names, categories, but you don't have systematic knowledge. Okay. And what happens in biology is the role played by stochastic nonlinear dynamical systems precludes what I, I call an uncritical reductionist realism. In other words, if you want to be a reductionist, and just say you're looking at particles, or looking at different pieces of, of, of a puzzle, but the puzzle's not connected, 
then you're not going to get a biology. Because biology is basically dynamic. And that was my main point last week. Without dynamics, you don't have biology. And those dynamics have to be of interacting, uh, interacting, in this case, molecules, or interacting cells, depending on what level you look at. Genomics eliminates the possibility of an uncritical understanding, just as the new science of Galileo and Newton and the relativity and quantum theory. So whereas physics was affected both by Newton and then by the relativity theory and quantum theories, biology is fundamentally transformed by systems. Prior to systems, you have one subject, an Aristotelian subject, basically collections and categories, but not a science as we currently understand it. Genomics must depend on a mathematical experiment of duality. Reasoning about data is not good enough. We have to formalize it. We have to formalize our reasoning. Experiment's the key. And this is one of the great emphases I'll put throughout these talks. From experiments, we get measurements. Okay? The knowledge we have concerns the relations among those measurements. What are the relations between the measurements? The relationship between, let's say, uh, gene expression and the structure of the cell, or transcription factors and the decisions made by the cell. Those are relations. And those relations have to be formalized. And the only way they're formalized is through mathematics, because mathematics is the subject of, of, of relationships. Mathematics is, the, is about relations. It formalizes relations. Okay. Second of all, we have to have a criteria of validity. When is the model we make valid? Okay, we have to formalize that. And what are those criteria? I go back to Gestat's statement. There has to be rules of the game. Who is going to make up the rules of the game? We have to make up the rules of the game. We have to postulate the criteria of validity. And that's the role of epistemology, to formalize all of these conditions. That's, our, that's what has to be done. If that's not done, then you don't have anything. You don't have a subject. You have no science. Okay? You have to formally write these things down and formally articulate them. Now let's look at this problem of classification, which will haunt us throughout uh, these talks. Okay? Here we have some data, and it's from uh, a breast cancer, BRCA1, BRCA2 data. You can probably read it better than I can. And we have this, uh, this um, heat map, and we have different uh, genes. And it looks like, if you look at this, gene expression can be used to diagnose hereditary breast cancer. One of the first papers on this problem was, was using this kind of data. Why? Because it looks like BRCA1 and BRCA2 are different, different intensities, different expression levels for different genes. It looks that way. But how do we formalize that? Does that actually make it, is that actually there, or is that just an illusion, or is that something our mind is creating looking at a picture? To, make, to give this thing meaning, let's consider a classification rule. On one side of this line in red, you have BRCA1 patients. And on the other side, you have BRCA2 patients along with some sporadic tumors. You look like, it looks like you built a classifier that can separate these two populations using two genes. Okay? The question is, what does this picture mean? The picture was created from data and a rule. What does it mean? Can we interpret it? Does it have any relation to the real world? OK, what's the rule that we made it by? How do we get the features? How do we estimate the error? The error is certainly not zero. The error here looks like it's zero, but over the whole population, it's certainly not going to be zero. Okay? And what is the underlying distribution of the data, the population? We just have some samples here. What does the underlying population look like? And do we even know what the population is if this data was collected haphazardly, which it was? Okay. I know because I was involved in the project that worked with this data. Okay. Um, epistemologically, we have to build some model to give this thing meaning. And I will do that later in, the, in these lectures directly. Okay. Here's, our pro here's our fundamental problem, what, first fundamental problem. Here we have a famous uh, set of microarray data from the Netherlands. And you have 50, 295 microarrays of breast cancer and we chose from this data set 50 sample sizes of 50. We used leave one out, error estimation, tenfold cross validation, and V632 bootstrap. Don't worry about what these are. If you don't know what they are, there are methods of error estimate. We used linear 
LDA, linear classification. And we wanted to estimate the error. Without an error estimate, what do we have? I mean, when you build a classifier, you know it's error. When the patient comes in, the doc would like to know that 10% of the time he's wrong. Tells the patient, I believe you have BRSA1, and we're going to give you the treatment for that, but 10% of the time we're wrong. What if it's actually 40% of the time he's wrong? Not so good. Okay. So what you have here on, on, on the bottom axis are the error estimates for the different cases. They went out, cost validation, bootstrap. What you have up here is the scatter diagram. Notice the regression line between the, est the, the estimated error and the true error. There's no regression. There's no regression at all. In fact, there's negative regression over here. It's like negative regression. It's like the bootstrap says negative regression. So you have no regression and wide varying. In other words, these error estimates are meaningless. They're meaningless. They tell you nothing about the error. Okay? So if you're using these estimates, you're doing nothing. Okay? And my sixth lecture will have a lot on this type of problem. The problem here is what are the rules for validity? If you pick up a paper and someone says, I'm using leave one out error estimation and doesn't justify it, you should throw the paper into the garbage. Okay? Today I was asked to review a paper. Just, here's an anecdote. I was asked this morning to review a paper, and the authors used <coughs> dendrograms, clustering. I wrote back to the editor my rejection. It took less than one minute to review the paper. I said, this method is unproven and unjustified. The paper, therefore, should be rejected. And it told me back two minutes later, says he rejected it. That's what should be done with such papers. It takes no more than one minute to review. They're epistemologically vacuous. OK. <clears throat> now, what's our problem? Everyday versus scientific thinking. What are the everyday categories of thought? Look, we all have to live. You all go to Boston, you eat pizza. You drink beer, you play with the children. OK, that's life. Let's do that. That's everyday life. Our categories are very informal. We don't carefully define our terms every time we have a, every time we have a discussion. Okay, And we have no particular criteria for truthfulness. We sort of go back and forth, and we're not too, we're not too, uh, too rigorous on that. We're very subjective. Okay, It's one subject talking to another. We don't look to try to communicate at some objective level to this. Okay? And we have a naive belief in the intelligibility of the real world. You don't stand there in everyday conversation and meditate on the meaning of the real world. If you did, people would think you were nuts. Okay? You don't do that. However, in science, everything changes. Scientific categories have to be very formal in their meaning so that we can communicate them and know what we're talking about. And we have to have criteria for truthfulness. That's a big issue. What are the criteria for truth? They have to be intersubjective. In other words, when two scientists talk, it's assumed that they know what each other's talking about. In other words, they could, if they're going to make statements about the theory, they actually know what the statements mean. Okay? And you will find that's being violated quite often these days. Okay? In many papers, you have no idea what the authors are saying. Okay? And we do not assume the intelligibility of the real world. That's critical, and that's going to be a good part of my lecture tonight. We don't assume the world is intelligible because we, we have to model what we observe. We don't try to impose our own preconceived subjective categories on the world. Okay? And that's critical. Now let's go back to the beginning. I'll talk about causality, because that's a real problem. For Aristotle, knowledge is the object of our inquiry. Okay. And men do not think they know a thing till they have grasped the why of it, which means to grasp its primary cause. Now, Aristotle had four types of cause. I won't get into that. But he, wanted, he said, without cause, we don't have knowledge. And he made no demarcation between physics and metaphysics. You can see there's some confusion already. Metaphysics drifts off into science. We don't know which is which. And the second issue is he requires a cause to have knowledge. In our book, we write three pillars. We talk about three pillars of Aristotelian science. For Aristotle, there are three points. To know is to explain. He was a philosopher. He wanted to explain things. Okay? Explanation must involve a causal relation. If it doesn't, he rejected it as being valid. 
And there is no demarcation between physics and, metaphysics and metaphysics. Notice he's writing as a philosopher, and yet he's trying to found science. Okay, You see the problem right at the outset. He's a philosopher trying to found science. Okay, And everything is based upon philosophy. Intuitive philosophy of the human thinking, everyday thinking. Aristotle was the everyday man. His thinking was everyday. It was not very abstract. Okay? Much of the struggle to advance scientific epistemology is trying to break down these three pillars of Aristotle. Now, let's jump very quickly up to Galileo, where everything changes. Galileo writes the following in the world of Salviati, his mouthpiece in his dialogue. We don't really understand what principle and what power it is that moves the stone downward most important line that may have ever been written in scientific epistemology. We don't know what makes that stone go down, OK? Any more than we understand what moves it upwards after it has left the projector or what moves the moon round. Aristotle believes, that, uh, Galileo believes in causality, but he doesn't require it. He puts it aside and says, we really don't know what's going on here. All I need to do is describe the behavior. Okay? That's a huge advance in scientific thinking. Newton formalizes all this. He writes in the Principia, for I here design only to give a mathematical notion of these forces without considering their physical causes in C. This is a jump way out of Aristotelian science. It is enough that gravity does really exist and acts according to the laws which we have explained and abundantly serves to account for all the motions of the celestial bodies and of our C. He doesn't claim to know what gravity is. In fact, he doesn't know. In fact, we don't know today in that sense. Okay. We, we still don't know. Have it. What's the intuitive notion of gravity? We can describe it as warp, warp space being warped, but I don't think that gives as much of an intuitive notion of it. Okay. Now, the issue, of course, is causality. Can we talk about gravity without causality? Yes, Newton did it. Okay, fine. He built the whole, he built the whole science without worrying about it. He still believed in causality, but it didn't, didn't impose it upon science. In the inquiry concerning human understanding, Hume tries to get at the problem and basically tries to define causality. He says, when one particular species of events has always, in all instances, been conjoined with another, we make no longer any scruple of foretelling one upon the appearance of the other, I, if, then. We, we call one object cause and the other effect. And here's the key line for Hume. We suppose that there is some connection between them, some power in the one by which it infallibly produces the other and operates with the greatest certainty and the strongest necessity. Hume argues that that's implicit in our everyday notion of causality, which I think it is. People would normally say, if something caused, this will happen and that will happen. OK, Where does that, what does that buy you? Well, he continues. This connection, which we feel in the mind, this customary transition of the imagination from one object to its usual attendant, is a sentiment or impression from which we form the idea of power or necessary connection. Nothing further is the, in the case. In other words, it's a sentiment for Hume. It's a habit. He calls it a habit often. There is no physical thing behind this notion of causality, except that we psychologically absorb, we, uh, assume it as a habit. Now, for Hume, this is a, this is a, a startling notion because Aristotle insisted that causality be the underpinnings of science. Well, if causality is a subjective subjective category, then science depends upon it. Science then loses its objectivity. It also becomes a subjective category. Okay? Science has no ground of truth. And this was the great breakthrough by Hume. He saw that, that causality really wasn't, it wasn't logical, it wasn't physical. It was basically psychological. That doesn't mean we shouldn't consider it. In fact, if you jump out a window, you might be a, you'd be a damn fool if you think you aren't going to hit the ground 18 floors later. Okay? But that doesn't mean it's science. Okay? Now, I'm going to talk to the students here for a moment. This is one every every student of science should read the inquiry. Okay? Uh, in our in our book, uh, we note that before reading the inquiry, inquiry, you're a youth. After reading it. You've lost your youth. I distinctly recall losing my youth in a particular undergraduate course in which we read the inquiry. Um, it rattled my brains. They never recovered. 
Now, people want to have causality. So Bertrand Russell wrote a, a famous essay on, called On the Notion of Causality. And he writes, the principle of same cause, same effect, which philosophers, notice how he sticks in the word philosophers, imagine to be vital to science. Notice they have philosophers imagine it to be vital to science, is therefore utterly odious, which means useless. Okay? As soon as the antecedents have been given sufficiently to fully enable the consequence to be calculated, the antecedents have become so complicated that it is very unlikely they will ever recur again. Hence, if this were the principle involved, science would remain utterly sterile. In other words, there are so many factors. You have to worry about a blade of, a blade of grass falling into the ocean. Okay? You can't worry about the blade of grass falling into the ocean. Science doesn't do that. Now, Schrodinger, of course, brings it up into the 20th century. And is, he makes the matter quite simple in some sense. He says, it can never be decided experimentally whether causality in nature is true or untrue. What experiment can you run? You can't run an experiment to determine whether causality is there or not. You'd have to articulate, as Russell said, all the antecedents. Try to run such an experiment. Okay. Awesome. Not even conceivable. The relationship of cause and effect, as Hume pointed out long ago, is not something that we find in nature, but is rather a characteristic of the way in which we regard nature. Okay? In other words, the notion of causality is not grounded empirically or logically. We may use it in our everyday world, but we have to be very careful if we're going to try to impose it upon science. And that's what happened in the quantum theory. It didn't work. Okay? And so it wasn't there. It was something we imposed in our everyday world. Now, in biology, the problem is also there because the systems that we deal with are so complex, causality can't possibly be talked about because the number of antecedents would be, again, in the millions. How many molecules are running around? How many transcription factors are running around? Okay? Causality makes, causality, biology brings us into the same world, where such a naive notion of causality can, cannot possibly play a role. Okay? In the simple world, it could play an intuitive role. If I throw a rock through a window, I can say, oh, the rock has caused the break of the window. Of course, I'm ignoring all the other factors. The Earth is spinning a certain way. The moon is up there a certain position, and so forth and so on. I don't worry about that. But once I get into biology, those factors impinge upon me immediately. So what does that mean? There's a famous book, a little book called The Mysterious Universe, um, by James Jean, a, a, a British uh, physicist in the first part of the 20th century. Everyone should read this book. I read this book again last this over the summer, just for the fun of it. And it was still beautiful. I have this old copy, old hardcover copy from when I was a student or whatever it was back then. And, um, and I read it again, and it was just wonderful. And if you want to really get a sense of science, really what science is about, read this beautiful little book. Okay? He writes, the final truth about phenomena resides in the mathematical description of it. So long as there is no imperfection in this, our knowledge is complete. We go beyond the formula at our own risk. We may find a non-mathematical model or a picture which helps us to understand it, but we have no right to expect this. And our failure to find such a model or picture need not indicate that either our reasoning or our knowledge is at fault. We may, we may draw pictures and we may do all kinds of little structures about us, but in the end, that doesn't what count. So we have a mathematical model which can predict behavior. Is that there or isn't it there? That means we have to have a notion of validity for that model. So I'm going to come back to that again. What's the validity of that model? And in this book, James writes the following. To really distinguish between the scientist and the everyday observer of, of, of the world. A mathematical formula can never tell us what a thing is. Newton understood that. Okay? But only how it behaves. It can only specify an object to its properties, okay, the properties of gravity. Okay? And these are unlikely to coincide in total with the properties of any single macroscopic object of everyday life. We need no longer discuss whether light consists of particles or waves. We know all there is to be known about it if we have found a mathematical formula which actually describes its behavior. And we can think of it as either particles or waves according to our mood and the convenience of the moment. 
You want it to be a particle? Fine. You want it to be a wave? Fine. I don't care. These are macroscopic, intuitive categories that we built up in our world. They don't necessarily apply to the microscope. It's a small world. Okay. Our notion of connection, relationships that we built up in our world, don't necessarily apply to biology, where the number of relationships in a system is in the millions. When you look at a system with two or three variables, you can get some intuition about it. When you look at a system with 100,000 variables, don't tell me you have any intuition. Don't tell it to me, because it's, it's completely crazy. Okay. If you're, going to, if you're going to probe a cell, if you think you can reason about probing that cell in everyday terms, you're really out of this world. That cell has so many regulatory mechanisms within it, okay? Expression, gene expression, transcription factors, po you know, post, uh, post regulatory factors, on and on and on and on, all of which are occurring in response to numerous simultaneous variables and stimulus coming from every place. You cannot hope to grasp that cell intuitively. My friend Mike Bittner, who wrote the book with me, said to me, I've been, trying to, I've been trying to move cells for my whole life, and they never move where I want them to move. Okay? It's because they have to be looked at much more abstractly in terms of systems theory. And this summarizes what I've been saying. We've lost intelligibility. Morris Klein is a uh, now deceased. He's an NYU professor of history, and mathematics, and science. He writes, the insurgent 17th century, Newton's century, found a qualitative world whose study was aided by mathematical abstraction. It bequeathed a mathematical quantitative world that subsumed under its mathematical laws the concreteness of the physical world. Think about that. The human condition has changed. The 17th century changed the human condition. Before that, for how many thousands and thousands of years humanity had been on this, on this earth, our idea was to apprehend what was around us, integrate that somehow, and I'm not a psychologist, so I don't know how, okay. integrate that somehow, and make decisions. In the 17th century, that changed. That, real, that quote, real world, was subsumed under mathematical relations, which could predict quantitative measurements. What science has done, then, is to sacrifice physical intelligibility for the sake of mathematical description and mathematical prediction. Our mental constructions have outrun our intuitive and sense perception. If you look at the theory of general relativity, try to intuiting that. I mean, I'm a mathematician. I have, I have no intuition. I, I have worked in stochastic processes for many years. I've written a large book on stochastic processes. My intuition never ceases to fail. As soon as the number of variables or that covariance matrix gets too large, the thing becomes impenetrable. Okay? I have to totally depend on the mathematics. I cannot understand what's going on. And I have to live with that. I have to live with that. And biology has to adapt to that. It has to adapt to the point that it's not going to understand what's going on in an intuitive manner. Um, and when it does that, it will move ahead much more rapidly. Now, is everybody happy with it? No, this isn't a happy moment. This isn't necessarily a happy moment. Maxwell, one of the greatest of all physicists, was quite unhappy about the whole thing. In fact, he writes, after generating his equations and becoming very famous, he writes, if the results of mere speculation, which I have collected, i.e. his equation, which was one of the greatest achievements in physics, okay, are found to be of any use to experimental philosophers in arranging and interpreting their results, they will have served their purpose and a mature theory in which physical facts will be physically explained will be formed by those who, by interrogating nature herself, can obtain the only true solution of the questions which the mathematical theory suggests. Maxwell thinks there's some other theory, which is intuitive and physical, that's going to go beyond the mathematical theory. Okay? Of course, it never happened. And he, his work was one of the main reasons it never did happen. Okay? But you see, he was still clinging to the notion that somehow behind all this, I can get an intuitive grasp of reality. So when, where is the criteria of truth? If it's not in our intuition, and surely we don't want to trust our intuition, it lies in prediction. From the moment Hume wrote in the, in, in the, Hume wrote in the 18th century until the 
beginning of the 19th, 20th century, physics changed things around. Science was in a quandary. There was no ground of truth. Hume understood that all our projections were probabilistic. He has wonderful description of probability in, in, in the inquiry. But he never really gets the fact that that's what that we have. And we have to formalize that theory of probability to get a theory of knowledge. He doesn't realize that. Okay? But that's not surprising. It wasn't realized for the 20th century. And a lot of geniuses went by the board who didn't realize it. Feynman puts the thing into my favorite way. It's my favorite quote. I, I always use it from Feynman. Of course, Feynman is wonderful with words. He likes to, little, he likes to dig it real deep. Okay? Um, it is whether or not the theory gives predictions that agree with experiments. It is not a question of whether a theory is philosophically delightful or easy to understand or perfectly reasonable from the view of common sense. No, none of that. The theory of quantum electrodynamics, his theory, okay, describes the nature as observed from the point of view of common sense. And it fully agrees with experiments. So I hope you can accept nature as she is absurd. Nature is not absurd in its own, from its own perspective. It's absurd from our perspective. And why should we expect it to be any different? We live within nature. Look, I have a dog who I love, Maggie. Okay. Do I expect Maggie to understand calculus? No, I don't understand Maggie to understand calculus. But there are many things in this nature that I, don't, that I shouldn't be expected to understand. Because my limitations are limitations of humans. Maggie's limitations are limitations of a dog. Now, perhaps my limitations aren't quite as strong as her limitations, although sometimes I wonder. Okay. But I have limitations, and so do you. So to, know, to think that somehow you're going to intuitively grasp within the mind, which was formed within nature, nature itself, is quite bizarre if you want to think about it. Okay? It's, it's not there. We're not there. And Hume realized that. So we rely on prediction. Prediction becomes the tie to empirical reality. If I can predict something, then I know it. Okay? Then, I, then I have confidence I have a model which means something. Okay? If I can't predict anything by my mathematics, it can mean anything. Who knows what it means? Okay. In a wonderful book on, the, on, on, on scientific philosophy, his famous book, The Rise of Scientific Philosophy, Hans Reichenbach puts it this way. If the abstract relations are general truths, they hold not only for the observations already made, okay, but also for observations not yet made. They include not only an account of past experiences, but also predictions of future experiences. This is the addition which reason makes to knowledge. Observation informs us about the past, and the present reason foretells the future. Our minds can foretell the future. Not exactly, but we can make predictions and raise expectations about the future. And if the models can predict correctly the future, correctly at least to a point, then those models have validity. If you're going to pour over data through some data mining algorithm, which I'll come back to shortly, and find patterns in the data, you're not trying to find knowledge. You're simply trying to find existing patterns and existing data. You might find them, but do those patterns have any predictive, predictive capability? If they don't, then they're not scientific. So what does that mean about clustering papers in the literature? Throw them all out. As Hume says, throw, the, throw them away. He has the final lines of the inquiry. He says, throw everything away. Throw this away. Throw that away. Unless that clustering algorithm has predictive capability for what it finds, it has no scientific content whatsoever. None. Okay. It's simply a posteriori mashing of data, which is, quite, which is not going to get us anywhere. The brain has to be involved. You see, the mind, reason has to allow us to integrate the concept so we can produce relations which are predictive. And that involves reason. It doesn't involve running algorithms and mashing data. Everybody knows this. So why, why have we forgotten it? Let me quote two historians. Forget scientists. Brilliant Ariel Durant in The Story of Civilization, a nine-volume, ten-volume tome, uh, which they spent their lives running, write the following. Mathematics grew in the 18th century because it was the basic and indispensable tool of all science, reducing experience and experiment to quantitative formulations that made possible precise prediction and practical no one could possibly write it better than these two historians. Okay? Precise prediction and practical control. What are we about in our business? We want to cure patients. 
We've got to make precise predictions and obtain practical control. That's what we're all about. Okay? That's what science is about. If we're not about that, we're not doing science. And this is not strange. Here it is, sitting in a, hitting in a history book. Okay? Now, the fact that it's the fact that there is so much non-scientific material in the quote scientific literature brings us back to cassette. There's something wrong. We've lost our interest in the truth. We've lost interest in truth. Okay, that's our problem. Now, what about it? What's a scientific theory? A mathematical model consisting of variables and relations between the variables. Relations is the key word, not just observations. What are the relations? Okay, I want to know the relations between a phenotype and the genotype. If I don't know the relations between that, what good is knowing the gene, the gene activity going to do me? I need to know the relationships, because at the phenotypic level, I have to know what are the consequences to the drug I'm giving. If the patient's dead, the drug hasn't done very much good. I have to have what are known as operational definitions. That's, that's what these are called. They relate the variables to observable and measurable phenomena. In physics today, you have string theory. There's a wonderful book written by um, Lee, Lee Smolin called The Trouble with Physics. And part of the, most of the book discusses the fact that in, in string theory, there are no operational definitions. There's no way to relate the mathematical theory to the physical world. So he asked himself throughout the book, where is the science? And he quotes Feynman. Feynman says, where are the predictions? Okay. Okay, it's not just, the problem is not just in, in biology. The problem is in, in, in the culture, a lack of concern with the truth. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not a physicist, and string theory may well be correct. But unless someone tells me the operational definitions by which we're going to validate the theory, I don't have science. And as Smolin says, no one's done that okay, in 30 years. 30 years, we still don't have those operational definitions. And no one even knows if they can find them. And we have to have experimental design to protest predictions made by models. You have to design experiments. Very difficult. Very difficult. The hardest part of science often is designing experiments. To design a proper experiment to pull out what you want to pull out is extremely hard. That's why there are so few good ones. <laughs> That's why students study the few that there are. Okay. A scientific theory is validated to the extent that predictions derived from it agree with the observations. Predictions don't agree with the observations. The theory is invalid. Now, what are scientific statements? They're symbolic formulae that must be tied to observable phenomena. See these operational definitions. Reason statements about physical phenomena do not constitute scientific knowledge. Nothing is more appalling to me. I don't, do, I don't read these papers anymore. But to read a paper with clustering, and the clusters are made, and after that are made, the authors go on and, and, and make comments. Well, it's reasonable that these should be in the same cluster because there are various biological reasons that they should be. Okay? If that's not a, pure, a posteriori uh, you know, uh, rationalization, I don't know what it is. Explaining data in a reasonable way is not science. I saw this, therefore this must happen. That might happen, maybe this happens, maybe this doesn't happen. So what? How is that intersubjective? I can put 10 people in the same room and 10 people give 10 different explanations of why the data is relevant. That's certainly not intersubjective. Science does not trust reason fully. We trust prediction. Don't trust reason. Otherwise, you would trust all kinds of crackpot theories that have been down over the list. There are two millennia. Or three millennia. Science is not apologetic. It requires fundamental relationships which make predictions. Here are some non scientific statements. <laughs> model A matches reality better than model B. Sounds like Aristotle. Okay? Yet I've heard people talk that way. My model matches reality better than your model. I have no idea what that statement means. More variables give a finer fit and therefore provide models closer to reality. Fine, throw in 10,000 variables, 50,000 variables, make the thing as complex as you want. Then try to validate it. In fact, if you throw enough variables in, you could fit every, you could fit the data perfectly. You want a good fit to the data? There's a theorem which says you can always find a neural net sufficiently complex to match, to match the data perfectly. You can always get perfect prediction for the data you have. 
the day that you have. It doesn't say anything about the future day. An analog model is more real than a discrete model. This is what I've heard often. If you discretize the model, you're losing information. What information? Can I make predictions better or not? That's the only question. Analog model may be useless. Too much noise in the model. may be impossible to estimate the coefficients of the equation. Okay? You have no model. Or you have estimates which are no good. You have a final model, but the model doesn't predict it. And again, a finely quantized model is better than a binary model because it's closer to reality. I don't know that. Which model predicts better? That's the better model. End of story. We understand mathematical models because it's a product of human intelligence. That's what I started out with before. We build these models. We define the terms, and therefore we understand them. We do not understand nature, nor should we expect to. Maggie doesn't expect to understand nature. I know, I'm quite sure of that. Okay? And I don't expect to understand nature. And there's something quite strange about this note. I mean, it's it somehow one thinks he's God, that he should understand nature. I mean, it's quite a bizarre notion that a human being should understand nature. I, I, I find it very strange. Okay. Implicit in Feynman's comment is the existence of a set of statements whose predictive capability can be experimentally examined independent of reason. Several of us in here may make totally different arguments. I don't care. If the prediction, if mine agree with predictions and yours don't, I got the right. I got the science. You don't. Okay? You can argue till the cows came home. I don't care about that. Okay? Mental pictures are a step away from reality, according to genes, because they are not predictive. You should go back and read Descartes. Read Descartes' meditation sometime. He, he guarantees truth if the idea is clear and distinct. If the ideas are clear and distinct, that guarantees truth. Well, what if my ideas are clear and distinct and they differ from his? End of story. We go to war. Okay? That's usually the solution to that problem. Both sides have clear and distinct ideas, and whoever has more guns settles the issue. That's the Cartesian way of settling things. Okay? Not science at all. Science is intersubjective. The objectivity of scientific statements lies in the fact that they can be intersubjectively tested. I didn't. We don't say that we. Act, we, we don't say that we're going to. We first have to agree on the test, OK? We agree on the test, and then we observe the test, OK? My, my validity criteria may be different than yours. That's OK. Then we can't, we can't argue about it, OK? But that's the whole point of rules of the game. We have to settle on the rules of the game. But once we settle on the rules of the game, then we can, we can test it out. If there are no rules of the game, we have chaos. We have chaos, nothing else, OK? Intersubjectivity demands that scientific knowledge not depend on reason except within the strict rules of mathematics, i.e., the, the, the mathematical rules and the experimental prediction. Philosophical theory, otherwise, philosophical theories like Marxism could be claimed to be science. This would be cult science, open only to those who claim to understand empty phrases such as dialectical materialism. I, I don't know when I was a youngster. I was in New Jersey and New York. Marxism was very popular. I used to hear people talk about dialectic materialism. I kept telling them it was an oxymoron. Okay? Didn't bother them with an oxymoron. They believed it anyway. You can believe anything you want. Any crackpot notion can be believed. Okay? Science doesn't accept that. We don't accept crackpot notions. Okay? Unless we all agree to the same crackpot notion. Of course, then we'd be in deep trouble. But we have to test them. Science requires observability. And this is where biology has to be very careful. Very, very careful. Just as physics must be very careful. Okay? According to Schrodinger, it is really the ultimate purpose of all schemes and models to serve as scaffolding, scaffolding, not complete description, for any observations that are at all conceivable. There does not seem to be much sense in inquiring about the real existence of something if one is convinced that the effect through which the thing would manifest itself in case it existed is not observable. Now, let's look at the cell. You're going to have to really, really focus on certain variables in the cell that can be observed and for which experiments can be run. If you say I'm going to have a model in which I include 100,000 molecules, you'll not be able to observe that. 
There's no way you're going to make all those observations. So don't make such a model. If you can't build an experiment, you are limited. That doesn't mean 100 years from now somebody can't build an experiment. But what experiments can I build today? Experiment, we have to have something on experimental capability. This puts great pressure on the experimentalist to come up with new experiments and try to design experiments. We should be trying to build experimental apparatuses that can answer the questions you want to ask. What is the point of designing data collected machinery if we don't know the question we're going to ask? Think about that for a moment. You're going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars or billions of dollars on, on apparatus, and you don't know what your question you're going to ask. It's very strange. Okay. What are the questions you want to ask? Then worry about building the experimental capability. Scientific ability is not absolute, not absolute. I keep mentioning that. We have to agree on it. Einstein has the most wonderful statement on it. In order that thinking might not degenerate into metaphysics, now he doesn't, he's not against metaphysics, or empty talk, that's what he doesn't like, it is only necessary that enough propositions of the conceptual system, i.e., that relation, set of relations we have in our mind, be firmly enough connected with sensory experiences, i.e., the observation, and that the conceptual system, in view of its task of ordering and surveying sense experience, should show as much unity and parsimony as possible. In other words, don't build an overly complex system. Take the simpler system. But make sure it's tied to observations. The meaning of validity must be defined differently in different circumstances. Validity for network and network control is different than the validity for classification. Those are two different types of procedures. Therefore, the validity criteria have to be separately defined. It's not a trivial matter. Um, this slide, which I'm going to skip, you can read it. I basically, from what I, I wrote in the paper, it says, there is no non-mathematical way to precisely describe knowledge regarding model validity. It depends on the choice of validity measurement. What are the properties of that? You have to make decisions. Okay? You really have to make decisions. And we have to somehow discuss them. How much time is being spent these days discussing validity criteria? Ask yourself that question. Hardly any. Hardly any. How are we going to treat patients? How are we going to do that if we don't know what it means to have a valid theory? Are we just going to try this out randomly on patients? We don't even know what the failure rate is. That's where we're at. Now, I've talked about models and validity. And that's uh, two thirds of tonight's talk. And now I'm going to talk about discovery. Look, if I have a model, Suppose I, suppose I go to the beach. I go to the New Jersey beach where I grew up. Okay? I lay in the beach, and suddenly a brand new theory pops into my head. Pops into my head. I write it down. Have that piece of I write it down. I test it. It turns out to be valid. That's fine. I've discovered the theory. Okay, this wonderful theory. But that's not the way theories are normally discovered. Usually discovered by trying to think about observation and trying to pull knowledge apart and running experiments which are towards discovery. Not experiments for validation, but for experiments to lead to discovery. There are two problems, discover, discover and validate. Now, validation is somewhat easy to understand because it says we have to posit the criteria of prediction. And that's fairly, although not complicated, I think we can do that. But discovery is a much more complicated issue. You can be laying on the beach. You, as Einstein said, at least he supposedly said, <laughs> creativity is 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. But where does that 10% inspiration come from? Okay. So knowing the constitution of scientific knowledge and how to validate it leaves open this question of discovery. We need to observe nature, but in what manner? And that's the key issue. How do we observe nature? And we're going to go back to the beginning of the modern period with Francis Bacon and the Nova Morgana. Who, who was the first uh, philosopher to really break away from Aristotle. Aristotle was pa involved in passive observation. Passive observation. You, you walk around, you observe nature. You observe nature. And then you try to create categories about the things you observe, definitions, species, etc. Beckin says, no. Accidental experience is a mere groping 
as the men in the dark that feel all around them for the chance of finding their way when they had much better wait for daylight or light a candle and then go. But the true method of experience, on the contrary, first lights the candle, and then by means of the candle shows the way, commencing as it does with experience duly ordered and digested, not bungling or erratic. In other words, design the experiment. The statistician has two roles in science. One is to create validation criteria and study their properties, because they are statistical at heart. The other is to design experiments. Those are the roles of a statistician. Now, I'm sure there are many statisticians, not here, of course, doing neither of these. That means they've abandoned science. Right? We need experimental design. And it's very difficult. The biologist, the experimentalist, the one who works with the apparatus, is not capable, knowledge-wise, of designing experiments alone. Because these are probabilistic experiments, and the, and, the, and the observations are going to be statistical and random. And those random results have to be interpreted. And they have to be interpreted within a, science, within a statistical theory. Without that interpretation of the theory, they mean nothing. We don't live in a deterministic world where I run the experiment and I say, ah, it happened or it didn't happen. It's going to happen sometimes. It's not going to happen other times. That's because we live in a very complex environment. We can't specify all the variables in our model. The statistician is supposed to analyze that problem. He's supposed to tell the biologist whether or not his experimental apparatus is sufficient to make any meaningful conclusion. Now, when the biologist collects gene expression measurements of 50,000 genes, let's say 30,000 genes, whatever, proteins, ESPs, whatever you want to collect, and so they have 20 replicas, the statistician is supposed to tell him not to do it because he can't possibly draw any meaningful conclusions. Okay, That's the statistician's job, to say, don't do it. I've done that. I've also walked away. People have said, we're going to do it anyway. I say, fine, do whatever you want, but don't call me find somebody else. I'm not interested. Okay. Now, over a century and a half later, after observing the course of science, observing much of the uh, 18th century, Kant writes in the Critique of Pure Reason these critical lines. In fact, this is, in, this is in the preface to the critique, because the critique has a lot to do with science. Reason must approach nature as a judge who compels witnesses to reply to those questions which he himself thinks fit to propose. I'm the experimenter. My reason proposes the question. To this single idea must the revolution be ascribed by which, after groping in the dark for so many centuries, natural science was at length conducted into the path of certain progress. Okay. No lines, in fact, you can read the whole thing if you look at the preface, okay? No lines are more, tell more about the notion of discovery. We have to design experiments, and we have to pose the questions we're going to ask. We don't, we don't, we're not involved in observation. We're up in methodological observation. M models represent knowledge that the science brings to the table. If I come to the table knowing nothing, I can't ask a question. I have to know something. I have to study the, exi I have to know the existing knowledge of the subject, bring that knowledge to the table, and then pose the next question. Okay. If I know nothing about the subject matter, I can't pose a question. To give a statistician a bunch of data and ask them to say something meaningful is ridiculous. Statisticians don't even about the subject matter. Okay? Can't possibly ask a meaningful question. Okay? He can find patterns, but they may be spurious. And I'm not doing anything. Okay? I have to know what I'm doing. Go back to Reichenbach. An experiment is a question addressed to nature. As long as we depend on observation of occurrences not involving our assistance, like Aristotle, the observable happenings are usually the product of so many factors that we cannot determine the contribution of each individual factor to the result, i.e., 50,000 50, variables. If you're looking at 20,000 or 10,000 genes, how are you possibly going to get, get at what those, fact, those genes are doing? I remember that when I first started working in microarrays back in the mid-1990s, and uh, we had the first results coming in. There was 500 uh, genes on the array, okay, 500 genes. And then, then somebody said to me, oh, we're going to get 2,000. I said, I don't want 2,000. Give me down to 50. Don't go to 2,000. 500 is already too many. You don't have enough replicates for 500. Give me less. Give me 50. I don't know what 50 to pick. And then you should be in another business. Okay? If you don't know what 50 to pick, you don't know enough biology to ask a question. That's the problem. 
I have to be able to ask the question. And that takes knowledge. Again, Reichenbach. Reasoning to science. By means of the artificial occurrences of planned experiments, i.e., for example, cell lines, okay, the complex occurrence of nature is thus analyzed into its components. That Greek science did not use experiments in any significant way proves how difficult it was to turn from reasoning to empirical science. This is a huge jump. Look, the Greeks were actually quite good scientists in their own right. They found science, yet they didn't discover the experimental design. It took 2,000 years to discover experimental design. Okay? And some of the best experiments ever done have been done in biology. Most clever experiments done in biology. How many students now get PhDs in biology without ever designing an experiment? Ask yourself that frightening question. Okay. Ask yourself. What are those students ever going to contribute? Probably nothing. Probably nothing. Okay. Because without the proper experimental design, you're not going to get anywhere. Okay. Now, am I going to say engineering is doing any better? No. We also are running off trying to train students on how to run experiments. Okay. So, it's, it's not just for biology. Okay? It's not just, I know about physicists. There are many physicists who never dreamed of conducting an experiment. This is, this is a real problem. Okay? In other words, we're going to go back to pre Galilean days. We're going to have pre Galilean science, back to Aristotle. And my favorite, of course, my, the greatest engineer is Norbert Wiener. I've been working with Arthur Rosenbluth, who was a physiologist. They wrote the following An experiment is a question. A precise answer is seldom obtained if the question is not precise. Indeed, foolish answers, inconsistent, discrepant, or irrelevant experimental results are usually indicative of a foolish question. Okay. One only needs to pick up randomly any, any journal today, and one can find many foolish questions, or no questions whatsoever, and plenty of discrepant results. Okay. And that, of course, leads us to the, the, the main the data mining, the subject which lives on a discrepant result. A meaningless result. Okay. Here we have formalized in one notion meaninglessness, okay, and a rejection of Galilean science and an effort to go back to Aristotle. Or before, I think some data miners want to go back to Egyptian science. Okay. They want nothing to do with thought, knowledge, experimental design, or any, anything which has anything to do with science. Okay. Data mining is a return to pre Baconian groping. Okay. Albeit at a much faster rate than what's possible. Now we can grope much quicker. Of course, we now grope through many more variables. Okay? It suffers from three debilitating properties. It does not ask precise questions. In fact, that's its basic principle. We don't have a question. Okay? There is no statistical characterization of the procedure. We don't know the distribution of the results. We don't have any, any probability distribution governing the results when we're done. We just have something, or an algorithm. Or something. I don't know what we have. We have a pattern. I've never quite known what we do have. As opposed to pattern recognition, serious pattern recognition, it lacks the characterization of the prediction in the context of a distribution. Can the results from data mining make accurate predictions? We don't even bother asking the question. In fact, what we do is we use data mining. We come up with a classification rule, some line or something. And then we use an error estimation rule to estimate the error that we know is no good. Think about that. Use an algorithm to produce a boundary for classification. And then you deliberately Make it use an error estimate, which you know is no good. And then you report it. I mean, think about that. I mean, I've been thinking about this for years, OK? It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing, OK? It shows a complete disinterest in truth. Complete disinterest in truth. To use error estimators which have never been validated or shown to work is bad enough. But to use one's environments where it's known that they don't work is even worse. And that shows a complete disregard for the truth. Okay. Now, sometimes data mining is justified by large sample theory. The statisticians love this. As n goes to infinity, everything will be fine. Of course, n doesn't go to infinity. n stops at 50, which isn't even very close to infinity. But for the statisticians, this is an egregious, egregious sin. Okay? Because the founder of modern statistics already discussed this problem. Ronald Fisher, in 1925, who was doing biology, by the way, he was in a bi working with biology, wrote the following. Little experience. That means you don't have to have much experience.
is sufficient to show that the traditional large sample machinery, i.e. n goes to infinity, of statistical process is wholly unsuited to the needs of practical research. Wholly. He threw data mining away in 1925. Okay. It amazes me that statistics departments would engage in such stuff. Okay. Here we have their godfather okay, telling him in 1925 that it was worthless. Okay. Not only does it take a cannon to shoot a sparrow, i.e. large sample theory, but it misses the sparrow. Only by systematically tackling small sample problems on their merits does it seem possible to apply accurate tests to practical data. Practical data. Now, in biology, we should be concerned with practical data, especially if we're in medicine, because the patient is practical. Okay? And yet, why would, we, why would we be messing around with asymptotic results where n goes to infinity? And we only have 50 examples to begin with. Okay? We cannot justify it. There's no justification to use such things. And the matter was settled 85 years ago. Not by nobody, but by Fisher himself. Okay. The problem we confront is a return to radical empiricism. Hume argued that there was no such reality as causality. Causality was not a physical thing. It was only psychological. And he further went on to argue that there is no connection between the facts. The events come and go, and the human mind cannot relate them in any rigorous manner. This was Hume's critical point that he made. Okay? And his argument was, well, since causality was the glue which held together these events, and since causality doesn't have any logical or empirical basis, then there is no glue. Well, the events together. Okay. Well, it took us till the beginning of the 20th century to realize there was a glue. The glue is called expectation or probability theory. Okay. Applied carefully together with a proper experimental design. It was the combination of probability theory and experimental design. Kamagorov, Andrei Kamagorov, was the greatest probabilist of the 20th century. He formalized probability theory. He was very concerned about the notion of experiments. Because he knew, back in 1920, he knew that the probability theory wasn't easily tied to the experiment. The theory was wonderful. He, he was able to complete the theory, but he knew that it wasn't easily tied to experiments. That, of course, was the role of statistics. Kamagorov was not a statistician. Okay? So the role of statistics was critical okay? to tie that together, and that then becomes the source of knowledge the predictive capability, and the statistical interpretation of those predictions, which are never certain. Okay? What you have in data mining, and what, you have in, and, and what you have now going on rampantly, is a return to radical empiricism of Hume, where there is no connection between the events. Okay? And the radical empiricism denies these connections, denies the model, and denies the role of reason. And Reichenbach puts the matter quite starkly. A mere report of relations observed in the past cannot be called knowledge. Whereas Aristotle was not talking about knowledge. If knowledge is to reveal objective relations of physical objects, it must include reliable predictions. A radical empiricism, therefore, denies the possibility of knowledge. One should meditate this on this, especially our students, on, on, on the statement of Reichenbach. You are denying the possibility of knowledge. You're shutting yourself off from knowledge if you involve yourself in, 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 in mindless uh, algorithms which just produce spurious patterns. Okay? A collection of measurements together with statements about the measurements is not scientific knowledge. We have to tie those statements to predictions. And unless you deal with the statistical distribution involved in the measurements as demanded by Fisher, demanded by Fisher, you're not going to have knowledge. You simply can't have it. The situation in classification is dire. It wasn't until 2005 that the first results were shown tying the error estimator to the error. That was one of our papers. And we've, we've solved several problems in the last five years doing that. No one else has solved any problems on it. 
this is a disaster. One, three people can't solve this problem. This requires a vast army to attack these problems. Okay? And they're not being attacked. And to conclude, Einstein is quite definitive. Science without epistemology is, insofar as even thinkable, primitive and muddled. Until we take serious effort, address epistemology serious, we're not going to go very far. There's been a lot of complaints about why genomics has failed. Okay, why, why, why we haven't cured cancer? Or why this or why that? Why, at the bottom level, the problem is epistemology, just as it was in physics. Biology is suffering a failure of epistemology, just as physics suffered a failure of epistemology. You have to spend a lot of effort getting at what it means to have biological knowledge, what kind of knowledge is possible, what are the limits of that knowledge. And what form should that knowledge take? And I'll be discussing this in the next five lectures. If you don't get at those issues, what are the, what are the proper forms of the knowledge, you're not going to ask the right questions. If you don't ask the right questions, you're not going to do the right experiments. And if you don't do the right experiments, you're not going to get anywhere. There's no way out of this box, OK? And so what you'll see in the next five lectures is my attempt, uh, my, from my colleagues, not just myself, to try to formulate these questions. For example, in the next lecture, I'm going to try to formulate what kind of relations are inherent in biology, in the cell. What kind of relational structures do we have in there? And, how to, and, and can we recognize those relational structures? And once we recognize those structures, can we then get at them formally by some mathematical methodology? And can we then get experiments to get at them? Okay. So these are the fundamental issues. Until I identify those, those kinds of structures which I, have, I want to get at, I'm not going to get anywhere. I have to come to the table with those questions, as Kant pointed out. I've got to come to the table with those questions, and those questions come from meditating on the problems. A cell is a very complicated uh, uh, entity, but it, uh, it has functions, some of us say. It accomplishes certain functions. If it didn't accomplish these functions, it would not survive. And because it accomplishes functions, I can, I can try to deduce what must the cell be doing to maintain those functions. And what structures must it have to maintain those functions? And then we're going to be on the ground of Conrad Waddington, who I'll mention next year. This was Waddington's thinking in the 30s. Um, Waddington, as my, my colleague Mike Bittner says, he argues that Waddington is the greatest, greatest biologist of the 20th century. He may not be, but he's the only biologist, I think, who has one of the great books of the Western world. Right? And Waddington spent years trying to analyze these problems. Okay? And his great contribution was, what, are, what does a cell doing? What does it have to do? He looked at development. What, what processes the cell must go through to develop? And if it doesn't go through these processes, can it develop? Okay. That's what you have to ask yourself. And once you ask yourself those questions, you can then go back and probe the cell. You can probe the expression to try to see if those things are being accomplished and how they're being accomplished. You narrow down the field of questions. Instead of a vast, unknown, infinite number of questions, the cell is constrained by its necessary activities, and this reduces the number of questions you can ask, and it becomes manageable. You no longer suddenly look at 30,000 genes, you're looking at 30. Okay? But the correct 30, okay, the correct 30, that is the issue. And that's what I'll, I'll talk about next week. Are there any questions for this week?